very interesting uh okay we'll go from for we were saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope for when a man sees a thing does he hope not hope for it or does he hope for it but if we hope for what we do not see we keep eagerly waiting for it with endurance in like manner the spirit also joins in with help for our weakness now they've muddled this up this should say the spirit also helps with our spirit for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the spirit himself not itself pleads for us unuttered gosh that's a bad translation with groanings which cannot be uttered but the one who searches the hearts knows the meaning of the spirit of what the spirit is because it is pleading in harmony with god for the holy ones now that's talking about the holy spirit working in us beyond our ability to reach god in the way in which only the holy spirit can do for us and i don't know if he'll explain it that way but this is a scripture about the holy spirit working in us in a way in which we are unable to do ourselves keeping us in order supernaturally working with our spirit and on our behalf approaching god with groanings which cannot be uttered because we are unable to what's he going to say pleads for us with unuttered groanings but the one who searches the hearts knows what the meaning of the Spirit is because it is pleading in harmony with God for the Holy Ones. So where's the Holy Spirit? He's in, he's in us. And he's working in harmony with God for us, through us, because of what Christ has done on the cross. Did you get that? If you're feeling so down or you just don't know how you're going to open your heart to Jehovah, with what is really weighing on you. He's telling you, Jehovah's Spirit, His Spirit will help you. And you know how that occurs? In the Bible, in the books of Job, Psalms, um, what's the other one I'm thinking? The oh, Gospel of John. Proverbs. Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. And especially in Psalms, you find some really heartfelt expressions that were made by the psalmist. And when you read that, and if that really kind of reflects how you feel, that's the Spirit helping no. you, kind of almost speaking in your behalf. No. Jehovah hears that. He recognizes that. No. And after all, isn't God's Word a product? Of He's just misrepresented the Holy Spirit completely. Holy Spirit. So when we read from these uh, different uh, books in the Bible, parts that really apply to how we feel jehovah's spirit is now speaking and helping us to pray to jehovah to talk so what he's saying is when you read a passage of scripture that helps you with how you feel that feeling is the holy spirit um that feeling is the holy spirit that's not true at all you can have the holy spirit there and want to jump out in front of a truck our psyche is not directly connected with the holy spirit in the sense of we can fully understand what's going on with what the holy spirit is doing in us all the time that's why the holy spirit bypasses our psyche and gets us back into harmony with god by the things that we need from him supernaturally just reading the Bible and getting tickles up the back of your neck is not a representation of the Holy Spirit at all. Talk to Jehovah. We need to really pray constantly to Him that He send us His Spirit and help us to yield to the influence. The, the Lord sent, through, through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago. ...influence of His Spirit. But in order for us to do that, what do we need to do? We have See, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Not a mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
to work in harmony with our prayers. We have to search out the counsel that's found in God's word. You don't have to work. The Holy Spirit's the one that works in harmony with God. Look for the Holy Ones. But he's making people try and do what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do for us. Theological abuse, viewers. Again, see what I mentioned before, read, meditate, and apply. We have to search out that counsel, and then we have to apply it. That way we're working in harmony with our prayer. Uh, we need yeah, but this is, all, this is all personal endeavor. There's no surrender to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit working in us. It's all about what we work to do. No. And that's theological abuse. To obey that wise instruction and, and then respond eagerly to the leading of Jehovah's Spirit. It now, he's just mentioned the leading of the Holy Spirit, and I have to give him credit for that. But you don't have to go through all this stuff to get the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of fact, you're better off just resting on, and, on Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you and not get involved at all in all this. This is just re religious rhetoric, making people do things they think they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. If not, again, we're basically wasting our time. But see, all of this... No, you're wasting your time doing all the stuff that they're asking you to do. That's what you're wasting your time. The Lord Jesus Christ has not got a mention. Not a mention. Is getting to know Jehovah. So, so far we've considered that we read his word regularly. Then strive to imitate him. Think about how Jehovah has dealt in different situations and imitate his forgiveness, his compassion, his love. And then this third part, speak to Jehovah often in prayer. And these are our basic things. There's nothing, you know, there's no great revelation here. But that's how you come to know him. But they're leaving out. Who are they leaving out? They're leaving out the whole reason that the New Testament is written. Jesus Christ. They've left out the Lord Jesus Christ. And how well do you know him? We know that in the world they don't know him, and that's why they have all these different concepts. And he's Well, I'm going to say that these people know the Jehovah that the Watchtower's made up, but they don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. They, maybe they do to a point. But not theologically. They've got people running around left, right and centre trying to make God happy to stop him from being sad by the, the five points to this and the six points to that. He's a harsh judge or he's far from us or he's so loving he forgives everything. You know, anything goes. He's all of that. And he'll do what he wants. But for now, if you come to Christ, you're saved by grace and that's all you've got. The rest of all of this theological psychological rhetoric is dangerous and it's theological abuse that's not really knowing jehovah and knowing jehovah also requires that we act and that's what we're learning and what have i said now he's saying act the things we think we need to do or not do to make god happy or stop him from being sad and anybody that knows romans 7 would be saying this guy is dangerous learning here otherwise we're really we can say all kinds of things but if we're not doing what he says if we're not following his principles and his will do, do we really know jehovah god he's Remember, a he's this, a snaky old crafty old man this bloke isn't he do we really know the doubt that he's sowing it's not about you knowing jehovah it's about christ knowing he come to us in Christ. Gosh, not one mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, this talk is how well do you know God? How well do I know God? Well, I can tell you, mate, listening to this talk, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit, all that well at all. It's, it recalls for some uh, self-examination.
Oh, the fourth gosh. point that will help us to come to know Jehovah is to do Now, we need a drum roll for the fourth point, viewers. This is it, because this is going to make him or break him. Let's get a drum roll going. Will he mention the Lord Jesus Christ? Develop a personal, a close personal relationship with him. Uh, again, in the Watchtower, we talked about being specific in our plans, in our goals. Well, here, we need to be specific also in our prayers. And you know what? When you're specific in your oh, prayer no. and you pray to Jehovah for something and then you're aware that Jehovah has answered that, how does that make you feel? Even if he answers it in a very subtle way. It could be that he answers it uh, from a talk or a watchtower or in a conversation with a mature brother or sister. There's so many different ways that Jehovah can answer a prayer that we have. But when you see that you've been praying for something very specific and you then see the answer, what does that do for you? Have you ever experienced that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you have. And if you have, doesn't that draw you closer to Jehovah? Doesn't he become more real to you? Because you say, you know, I'm not just saying these things in a prayer. I saw the answer to a specific thing that I prayed to Jehovah about. And we draw closer to him. He becomes more real to you. And uh, the more that you express your innermost concerns to him, the closer he's going to draw to you. Because how does he feel as a father? You feel... Do you know how close the Lord is to you? He's actually in you. We just read about the Holy Spirit. He just took us to the part where the Holy Spirit's harmonizing you with God. Oh, dear. But there is an element of truth in what he's saying about sensing God and feeling close to him, which is wonderful. But still, not a mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he says, well, my child has approached me with this heartfelt petition or plea. I, I, he has that much confidence in me, he or she. So I'm going to do something. So you draw closer to him when you see his answer, and he draws closer to you because of the confidence that you've shown in going to him and sharing these innermost thoughts. When we have such a relationship, we're aware of Jehovah's loving interest in us. And then we also realize something, that our actions affect him. What oh, we do... gosh. Okay, see? What we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. This is very theologically, theologically abusive because the only approach that we have towards God and the only way in which God sees us is through his son. It's not through the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. So this is going to get real abusive. Affects Jehovah, the greatest personage in the universe. What we do as an individual affects him. Uh, I'll give you an example. After delivering the nation from slavery in Egypt, uh, Jehovah offered to enter into a special relationship. If you've read the Bible or if you've studied it, you're aware. Uh, he entered into a special relationship with them. They became a special property to him. They were going to be used in an extraordinary way to fulfill his purpose. And so he develops a contract with them. He enters into the law covenant with the nation of Israel. Well, we know from our study of the Bible what happened, but turn in your Bibles to the 78th Psalm. Oh, no. Psalm 78. Oh, no. We're going to see this point about can we affect or have an effect on Jehovah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. No mention of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. No mention that the Holy Spirit's working in you so that you can rest. The 78th Psalm. Oh, Lord, dear Lord. Notice what it says. He says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and made him feel hurt in the desert. Made him feel hurt 
41. Again and again they put God to the test and they grieved the Holy One of Israel. The nation grieved the Holy One. How's this for a guilt trip? Woo! One of Israel. We as individuals can make Jehovah feel hurt. You cannot make God happy or stop him from feeling sad. He's protected himself through Christ. <laughs> He's protected us and him through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a ter terrible case of theological abuse. To think that you could have an effect on God like that? Oh gosh. We can grieve him and we can grieve his Holy Spirit. Now that's an important thing for us to know. Remember, coming to know him. You, you could grieve the Holy Spirit, but only by um, trying to approach God um, without Christ. That's basically how you grieve the Holy Spirit, by trying to approach God without Christ. Here's a, a facet of coming to know him that many people in the world don't realize, that their actions have an effect on Jehovah. No, I have to fully disagree with that, because we have a mediator who is the Lord Jesus Christ. They can hurt him. They can grieve Jehovah. If, if humans could grieve Jehovah, he would have committed suicide by now. I'm just going to say that because nobody could cope with all the failings of humanity. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to protect us from God's wrath. And his Holy Spirit. The same way that an unruly child can cause his parents a lot of pain of heart, these rebellious Israelites caused Jehovah pain. They grieved him. But, you know, it can go the other way. We can also have uh, a positive and make him happy. See? And this is what I've said all along from the start of this channel. You cannot make God happy or stop him from being sad by the things you think you need to do. Christianity is about Christ. The finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and his grace. Make him glad. Can you think of someone who, aside from his son, can you think of someone uh, that made Jehovah's heart glad, that made him happy? I'm sure you can think of more than one individual. Someone that comes to mind is Abraham. Oh, why? Well, because what... Couldn't he have... Why hasn't he gone to the gospel of Christ? Does the Bible say... Abraham was referred to as what? Jehovah's friend. Jehovah's. But we're sons of God through what? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, he's not bringing out the gospel. He's not going to have a friend that he's not happy with. But Abraham made Jehovah happy. He affected Jehovah. So much so that he calls him his friend. That's an intimate thing. For <laughs> What's he leaving out, viewers? Watch this. Watch this. What's he leaving out? And this is the whole thing about theology. You cannot leave out the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have to go to Galatians. Where is it? Come on. Galatians. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Not by exercising faith, just through faith. Um, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, and if you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And he has not mentioned the Lord Jesus Christ even once. Imagine if he says, you, I consider you my friend. Wow. That would be, I don't know if there's a greater joy or experience than to know that Jehovah re, re, thinks of you and considers you his friend. If we come to know him, really come to know him, we can do the same thing. We can have that same relationship with Jehovah, the same way that Abraham did. 
But, you know, in doing that, we need to demonstrate. Remember what I mentioned, read, meditate, and apply. I'd have to pull this guy aside. If this was in a um, university or if he was behind a pulpit in any other church, he'd be pulled off. They'd pull him off because his theology is infantile and it's, it's got nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. We need to demonstrate that we've come to know Jehovah. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John. This will be interesting. 1 John, the second chapter. Look, this is all about and notice Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is a propitiatory uh, sacrifice for our sins. And First not John just ours, but the whole world. The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet does not observe his commandments, is a liar. Now, what's his commandments, viewers? What was the new commandment? Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. And I, we have to go to it. We have to go to it. Because once you start reading commandments and things, um, you get lost in legalism. The new command... Oh, now I'm panicked. Commandment. Come on. No. Command. New commandment. Okay, I'll just put... Oh, no, that's spelt wrong. Doesn't look right, does it? Bear with me, viewers. We've got to go to John. So we'll get down to our index. And there's John, and it'll be ver chapter 13. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God has given, um, glorified him. A new commandment. Now listen, this is the Messiah. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now if you keep, if you love him, you'll keep my commandments. What was his commandment? That you love one another. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. What was that? To love one another. Um, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me the commandment, which was what? To love mankind. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, which was to love one another, wasn't it? To love humanity and so on and so forth. So don't be misled by what this is going to say. And the truth is not in this person. So... Can we say we've come to know Jehovah if we don't obey him? If we don't obey his commandments? The Bible. Now he's talking about Mosaic commandments, viewers, but we know that it's not. Jesus gave a new commandment that we were to just love one another, not even love Jehovah, but to love one another. The rest would be sorted out. God's got the religious side of this sorted out once and for all, but we are to love one another, which is the hard part. These fools can love Jehovah and be terrible to people. Don't worry about that. The Bible's clear. It doesn't mince words. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's not ambiguous. It tells us clearly. If we say that we know Jehovah, then we need to obey his commandments. If we're not, then we're a liar. And what commandments is he talking about? Because it, I don't want to go to Romans 7 because it says if you keep the commandments, you're just arousing sin. The commandment that we are uh, to abide to and protect ourselves from this sort of mosaic legalistic language that com makes people think that there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, is this one, the new commandment that we love one another. It's got nothing to do with the mosaic law. And that person really hasn't come to know Jehovah. And it's got nothing to do whether you, whether you um, know Jehovah or not. It's about just being humane and getting on with humanity and letting the finished work of Christ do his, do his bit in your life by his Holy Spirit. This is a terribly abusive theological message. You know, uh, we talked a little bit about the nation of Israel. We know that they didn't keep their word. They didn't keep their part of the contract of the agreement that they had. As a matter of fact, during the reign of King... Do you know how dangerous this man is? The poor old Jews. God has a special plan for the Jews. They've got to go through the tribulation yet. But his love for the Jews is well um, before his love for us. 
we're adopted in. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And this guy's big noting himself, thinking that he can keep rules that you're not supposed to keep better than what the poor old Israelites did. How rude and arrogant is that? Jeroboam II, uh, the day of Jehovah was being foretold to strike the ten tribe kingdom that, that had split off. Uh, and Jeroboam II was king. And really, back then, during his time, on the surface, there was an air of prosperity because there was some land that, that they had lost, but under Jeroboam, they had regained that land. It seemed like things were going well. Um, they regained the land all the way to the, to the Dead Sea. So when they heard through prophets like Amos and Hosea that, hey, there's a destruction coming upon this ten northern tribe kingdom, they really didn't, uh, they didn't want to hear about it. And Jehovah didn't do anything right away because he wanted to give them time to turn around. He wanted to give them time. That's the kind of God he is. Because he didn't want to wipe out the nation of Israel from the face of the there earth. There you go. He's just saying, what sort of God is he earlier? Is he this? Is he that? He's a forgiving God. He's a patient God, isn't he? He's got, he is, oh no. He's a compassionate God. As, as nasty as he can be in the Old Testament. Now we're on this side of thing, but oh no. Talk about a guessing game with this lot. Theology's terrible. At that time. And he gave them time, according to Amos 5, 6, so that they could search for Jehovah and keep living. We have time right now to search for him, to continue to grow in our knowledge and appreciation of Jehovah. But that ain't going to save you, viewers. That is not what's going to save you. The Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him is what saves you. Not what you do. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saves us. Just let me take you to Ephesians 2. Uh, 2, 8 through 10. 8 through 10. Um, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, lest you should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to love one another, to be humane, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is all theological abuse. These Israelites, well, they could have used that time to return to Jehovah by getting to know him better, but we know they didn't. Notice uh, in your Bibles, turn to Hosea, the fourth chapter. Hosea 4. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 6. Notice how it's expressed. Okay, Hosea 4, I don't 4, even know what he's doing six. there. It says, Hear the word of Jehovah, O people of Israel, for Jehovah has a legal case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor loyal love, nor what? <coughs> nor knowledge of God in the land. Now keep in mind, these were Israelites. Did they know who Jehovah was? Sure. Did they have a history? Did they know about Moses and everyone? Sure. They knew about Jehovah, but he says there was no knowledge of God in the land. Why? Because they're under because the law. they weren't obeying. They weren't paying attention oh, to his no, prophets. No, they weren't no. doing what they were supposed to. Oh, and then in no. verse 6, my people will be silenced because there is no knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from serving as my priest, and because you have forgotten the law of your God, I myself will forget your sons. Because there was no knowledge. This is Old Testament theologically abusive religious rhetoric. And he should be dragged off the pulpit, and he should be dragged off. Even his countenance has changed. As the message has gone on, he's deteriorated. Now he's getting nasty with the Bible. They had stopped coming to, to know Jehovah by no longer following his principles and his laws. We don't ever want to be guilty of that. Where Jehovah says, you have stopped knowing me. What, what happened? We don't ever want to let that happen to us. What a guilt trip.
us. The Israelites, their knowledge was dead because it didn't move them to do his How will. Dang. You know, we can look at this even in personal matters, um, such as in family life. I'll give you a, a few simple examples. Husbands, what does Ephesians 5, 28 and 29 say? It says this, Husbands ought to be loving their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but he feeds and cherishes it as the Christ also does the congregation. How did Jesus feel about the congregation? When we read in the scriptures, he loved them. He held them dear. Jesus just got to mention viewers. Now he's undermined his whole message. He's got the Messiah in there. That's what we want to hear. He cherished them. And even though they were imperfect, he was gentle and kind to them. Is that how we as husbands are with our wives? That's how we if should we be. know Jehovah, then that's what we should be doing. Knowing Jehovah means following that example as husbands. So you can see how knowing God comes into every aspect of our lives, including family life. What about wives? Ephesians 5.22 says, Let wives be in subjection to their husbands as to the Lord. Jesus was a perfect example of submission. And as a wife, if you know Jehovah, you also can be a real good example of submission. Adam, and what did she do? She didn't respect that arrangement. She went over his head, as it were. She decided to do her own thing. No, she was deceived. You can't just do this. Eve was supernaturally deceived. Uh, as a wife. Is that what you do? Talk about controlling again, the women. Jesus God. showed the perfect example. If we know Jehovah, we're not going to be perfect. Don't, don't. That's not what we're saying. But we're going to try hard. And remember, Jehovah says, strive to imitate him. And of course, to imitate his son. And children, you're not getting out of this either. The son just gets a mention at the end. Two words, the son. Uh... Children need to follow the Bible laws and obey their parents. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 makes that clear. Children, be obedient to your... Now he's hammering the children. Gosh. Parents in union with the Lord, honor your father and your mother. There are children, and it's sad to say, even within the Christian congregation at times, that lead double lives. When you lead a double life, you're showing that you're, you don't really know Jehovah. God, the guilt trip. your parents. The guilt trip. And Isaiah, uh, because even back in Israel, there were young ones that were living double lives. This isn't something new. Isaiah said this, Woe to those who are going very deep in concealing counsel from Jehovah himself and whose deeds have occurred in a dark place while they say, Who is seeing us? Who is knowing of us? Oh, dear. Well, of course. Maybe your parents can't, but Jehovah can, and he does, and he sees what you do. So now Jehovah's creeping around all the corners and nooks and crannies. It's the same today. Even if you successfully hide your misconduct from your parents, as I said, you can't hide it from Jehovah. This so is an organization that's hiding to pedophiles. not be living that double life to get things in order. Your parents can help you. The, the elders can help you. We're here to help you. All of us can demonstrate that we've come to know Jehovah by associating with those who know him and love him. And of course, we would be distancing ourselves from Jehovah if we were to choose associates whom Jehovah rejects. And that includes not inviting them into our homes even oh, now he's <laughs> now. If you're not a Jehovah Witness, you're an outcast. You're a leper. Oh, this is disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. And through the entertainment that we watch or listen to, when we love Jehovah, friends, we demonstrate our love for Him. It's an active knowing of Him. It's a reading, meditating, but also an application and applying. And if we know Jehovah, we're going to enjoy blessings. What does 2 Chronicles 16, 9 in the 8 part say? It says something very encouraging. It says, For the eyes of Jehovah are roving about through all the earth to show his strength in behalf of those whose heart is complete toward him. Jehovah is searching for those that are, have their heart is complete toward him. He wants us to search for what is good. 
He wants us to love what is good and He wants us to do what is good so that He may show favor to us. And occasionally people may feel, sometimes we may feel, that no one cares about the good we do. Friends, it's guaranteed. Jehovah cares. And He cares about the good you do and that good will be repaid. So, does it matter what we do? Does it do what we do, does it affect our Father in heaven? Sure. Can we really come to know him well? Just do those four things that we mentioned. Oh, no. Read the Bible regularly. Strive to imitate Jehovah. Speak to him often in prayer. Develop a close personal relationship with him. But now, how well do you know God? You're the only one that can answer that. Oh, after all that. By your after actions. all that. You're the only one that can answer that. No. Look, the Lord Jesus Christ can answer that for you. Just turn to him. Others can tell. So strive to get to know him, especially while we have the time. Well, I have to say that's a terrible theological fail. It was a legalistic message. It was Christless. Um, there was mixed up... Um, meanings and all sorts of other stuff there was four points to christian perfection as it were i have to give that a fail now what do you think was that a pass or a fail thank you for joining me and bye for now